SpaceX gives a tour of Starbase before blasting the entire facility with fire and brimstone and decibels. Starlink puts a cap on yo ass, Falcon shelters through another Florida storm, and we finish with today's honorable mention. I'm Kevin, and this is SpaceX in the News. Just after last Friday's episode dropped, SpaceX released a Life at Starbase video on their own channel showing off, well, Life at Starbase. Derp. Take in the scenic South Texas views and get mesmerized by Elon-inspired witchcraft that will one day make humans magically appear on Mars. Oh, and booze, bicycles, booty, botany, baristas, bivouacs, and boomage. Also, doggos. The company also announced that not only has its MVAC team built its 200th engine, but not to be outdone, so has its Raptor team, completing their 200th Raptor 2 engine. Bloomberg just published a story, writing SpaceX has adopted Tesla's Omid, Omed, Afshar, who led operations at the Austin plant, promoting him to vice president of Starship production at Starbase. Congrats, Omiad. Enjoy your time with the turtles. So it was beginning to look like Elon was bringing in additional help to steer the program, and then that notion was confirmed according to the website The Information, because SpaceX President Gwen Shotwell, who oversees Falcon operations, will now assume oversight of Starship as well following a summer of changes in strategy and delays in the program. Apparently, Elon has too much on his plate, and his recent purchase of Twitter and the headaches of preventing it from going bankrupt didn't exactly free up his schedule. Gwen has been with the company pretty much from the beginning and has a track record that proves competency, so it'll be interesting to see how the change in pace changes over the coming months. On Monday, SpaceX picked right back up with cryoloading Booster 7's methane tank as it rests fully stacked with Starship 24 on the orbital launch pad. Then later in the day, the company performed thrust testing on Starship 25 using hydraulic battering rams with the LOX tank cryo-loaded. On Tuesday, she was hoisted off suborbital pad A and later transported to the high bay for Raptor and shield installation. Also that same day, Ship 24 had its cord cut, so to speak, and was destacked off Booster 7. Views provided by my buddy, Lab Padre, and sped up by yours truly because we have more to get to. She was then moved next to Pad B because I assume they wanted to get her away from the heat Booster 7 is about to bring. But since they placed her big old booty on the pad, looks like her testing regimen isn't over yet either. Then on Thursday, a static fire was expected since notices went out, but instead B7 and the OLM underwent more testing, spend priming an unknown number of the booster's engines. More closures are in place next week, so expect things to get super heated, super thin. I am super, super serial. Moving on to Starlink, Sheets at CNBC reported that emails have gone out to current Starlink users in the US and Canada, informing them that services for residential, business, and maritime customers now include, I guess, soft data caps, since SpaceX has updated the Starlink website from no data caps to no hard data caps, which means anyone who uses more than a terabyte of Starlink data per month will have their speeds throttled from priority access to basic access during the peak hours of 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. This will provide additional revenue for the company as well, since customers do have the option to be automatically billed 25 cents for every additional gigabyte residential users use with continued priority access. This change was due to a small number of selfish users, we'll just assume the blame belongs with Twitch streamers, who have consumed unusually high amounts of data and is ruining speeds for everyone else who just wants their kids on their tablets and out of their hair does not affect me though, because the Starlink dish SpaceX sent me is defective. That's a joke. I've been on the wait list for almost a year, so I'm not quite sure how much this would affect me since my current garbage internet provider can't even run a functional website that shows me my average monthly data usage. If you happen to know yours, please inform us how much you use in your typical kind of streaming activity in the comments below. Thanks to Hurricane Karen, I'm sorry, that's Nicole, making landfall on the Florida coast, SpaceX is back to battening down the hatches at Cape Canaveral, moving their next Falcon 9 rocket to the hangar, where it will remain until it launches from Slick 40 for another Intelsat mission, currently slated for no earlier than Saturday. When it does launch, we'll cover it live on Rumble. Support free speech and subscribe using the link below. The Epic Times is our sponsor for today's video. I'd like to high five all of you today for tuning in with me to catch up on your SpaceX current events, but since I can't, I'll just give you a thumbs up and inform you of another way you can gather important news to fill that big old cranium of yours. Of course, through the Epic Times, which I definitely recommend. Not just because if you go to epictim.es slash spaceeccentric, you get two months for one dollar. 
but because they have all kinds of great content spanning a wide variety of topics like science, reporting honestly on all types of news happening here in the US and abroad in a convenient manner on all your devices. You also get access to original Epic TV programs and award-winning documentaries. Come now, I know we're all nerds here and you like documentaries as much as I do. So give them a try, I really do think you'll like it. Again, it's two months for a buck if you go to epictim.es slash space eccentric. There's a link provided below. But now it's time for today's honorable mention. Mission. And lift off. Early this morning, ULA launched their last Atlas V rocket from Space Launch Complex 3 at Vandenberg Space Force Base, California. The pad will now be converted for use for their next gen rocket, Vulcan Centaur. The mission delivered the Joint Polar Satellite System 2 into sun synchronous orbit a half hour after liftoff. Although at the time of putting this video together, no word yet on whether NASA has received confirmation that its solar array is deployed. But what I really want to focus on for this mission was the secondary payload, NASA's low Earth orbit flight test of an inflatable decelerator, or LOFTID, which yes, is a dumb acronym. Which is why I prefer the Decelerating Experimental Round Puff Plate, or DERP. After jettisoning JPSSS's adapter, Derp inflated its aeroshell to a pressure of 19 psi as the upper stage coasted back toward Earth's atmosphere. Deploying it for re-entry where the bouncy castle streaked through the night sky, popping shoe above its white hot self and cooling off with a dunk in the ocean east of Hawaii. If this balloonish looking heat shield looks familiar to you, it may be because I mentioned it in our parachute documentary back in 2020. NASA and friend ULA is interested in using the tech to recover engines from Vulcan rockets and for future landings on Mars. Well, that's all for this episode of SpaceX in the News. Thank you for joining me. My sincerest appreciation goes out to those of you supporting the channel on our Locals page, YouTube, Rumble, or through our sponsors, purchasing eccentric Merc on our store, what have you. When you get to the weekend, be sure to make it nominal. I'm calling, and until next time, Godspeed. Yeah,